Thank you so much for having us here tonight. This subject is near and dear to my heart, and if opiate addiction has not touched your family or your friends, then you're very fortunate. I unfortunately had our nephew become severely addicted to opiates and heroin after he had um, sustained a severe shoulder um, injury after being the mm -hmm. All Greater Rochester football player mm -hmm. for his local hometown. So great kid, great student, but ended up getting injured and then started down with prescription painkillers and then the road to addiction to heroin. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a little bit about opiates, how they've come to be um, so addictive and how it's come to be such a problem in our nation and in our local community. So like any plants that, um, like any medicine that starts, um, they usually originate from plants. And opiates are originally derived from the opium poppy, having been used for thousands of years for both recreational and medicinal purposes. The most active substance in opium is morphine. Morphine was first extracted from opium in a pure form in the early 19th century and it was used widely as a painkiller during the American Civil War and many soldiers became addicted. The increase in problems for our nation really began back in the 1980s when pain became the fifth vital sign. Pain scales were developed and the gold standard of medical care was to limit or minimize pain. This new demand for relieving pain led to the pharmaceutical company's development of stronger prescription painkillers and the creation of synthetic heroin. New painkillers came on the market with approval from the FDA, Vicodin in 1984, Oxycontin in 1995, and Percocet in 1999. Opioid painkillers produce a short-lived euphoria very pleasurable state, but they are also very addictive. It only takes about four days for the body to develop a physical dependence to them. Once a physical dependence happens and opiates are not available, the symptoms of withdrawal will occur. This can include severe restlessness, agitation, muscle and bone pain, insomnia, diarrhea and vomiting, and just a general feeling of misery. Because the withdrawal symptoms can be so severe, addicts will go to extremes to get the drug to feel better. Prescription painkillers can be very expensive, and this is why so many have turned to buying heroin on the street. An Oxycontin pill is about $40 on the street, a bag of heroin is about $10. All opiates have a serious risk of respiratory depression, and the individual can stop breathing, which can lead to cardiac arrest. In addition, street heroin often is laced with other powerful drugs, and we've seen this in our local uh, heroin being addicted or being laced with fentanyl. <clears throat> the deaths related to overdose from prescription painkillers and heroin have increased exponentially in the past five years, to the point that this has become a national epidemic. Many young adults that have become addicted say they got their first prescription painkillers from their home or their grandparents' medicine cabinet. Many also report getting initially exposed from a legal prescription from their doctor after having surgery or their dentist after having their wisdom teeth removed. Since 2000, the rates of death from drug overdoses involving opioids and heroin has increased 200%. The statistics of heroin-related deaths from the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office are increasing at an alarming rate. In 2011, there were 10 deaths, 2012, 30, 2013, 65, 2014, 95, 2015, a little bit of a decrease to 86, and already in 2016, we're at 90 plus. Being trained to administer naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan, in the event of an overdose is saving lives. Naloxone displaces the opiate that's on the receptor and basically draws the medicine right out of the brain so it reverses the uh, overdose immediately. Sometimes two doses might be needed. And I brought you guys a kit tonight so you can just take a look at what we were just doing. Our nurses have been trained to administer this in the event of an overdose happening in school. 
Um, but basically what you do is you, you're going to take the top off here, the bottom off here, you take the top off that and you would screw that into there, and then you would attach the atomizer and then just displace it into the nostril one side and the nostril the other side. So it's relatively simple. To date, the Henrietta Volunteer Ambulance from January to mid-September had administered at least 21 times. Additional strategies to combat this epidemic are on the rise and a new limits are being set forth to decrease the amount of medication that can be dispensed at one time. A practitioner can only give a seven day supply now versus a 30 day supply, which is gonna limit the amount of meds that are out there as well as limit the potential for someone to get addicted to them. And then beginning in 2017, the FDA is going to reduce the amount that they're actually producing by 25%. So less meds out there, hopefully less people will get addicted. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sure. Why did they list the, the heroin with other drugs? Is that like a sale feature or is it? They, they might very well do that to say it's stronger, so buy it from me versus you know somebody down the street, my stuff is more potent. But because they don't know what it's laced with, it can be deadly. Mm -hmm. And some of the kids will find uh, heroin puts them to sleep, so it's a, it brings them down, and sometimes they'll counteract with a stimulant drug, so they kind of get this perfect high between cocaine and heroin right in the middle where they say, if I just use cocaine, I get too nervous and too anxious, but if I just use coca uh, heroin, I fall asleep. So they find that middle place, and that's dangerous. Thank you. Know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, you talked about the trends within the county, or the nation and the county, what about Russia and Iran? Do you see any of this stuff going on right now? Well, that's where Paul's gonna come in. He's gonna start talking about some of our kids in, in the surveys that they've done, as well as um, their, their um, comments on what they're being exposed to and what prevention um, strategies that Paul is doing with the teens. Just, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned uh, how often the uh, naloxone <clears throat> pardon me, has been used by the Henrietta Ambulance. Has it been used by any of our nurses and to what extent? No, we have not needed to administer that. So in the event that we would, we would need to report that to the state. Yes? I'm curious if there are comparable rates of usage for any other narcotics. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, curious if there are comparable rates of usage for any other narcotics, so uh, cocaine, crack, anything else. If there's anything that's... Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. Um, so you mentioned that there's been a significant uptick in the usage for opiates, and particularly of heroin. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious whether we've seen any corresponding usage increases or, or if there's just, you know, if they've been kind of relatively flat, but they've been high usage for cocaine or any other drugs, any other form yeah, of drugs. I think mostly the pain, the prescription painkillers and heroin kind of go at a steady rate comparatively. Um, I mean, I don't think that the cocaine and the marijuana have the trends quite like how they've gone up exponentially. Mm -hmm. We did have um, a couple kids last year who I talked to who were using cocaine a lot of it's uh, who they're hanging around, so if they're buying from their marijuana dealer and they have cocaine available, they use that. The trend with uh, opiates tends to be more towards the older 25 to 30 range. And then the fastest growing group I think right now is 20 to 25. So when we see like college age kids, um, um, that number is higher for college age kids using that, the opiates. Yeah. Right, so the more work mm -hmm. that we do now, potentially we can impact them to be more prevention once they get on to college. Okay. Um, my, my thought putting this together when we talk about our kids, um, you know, is what is the main reason kids would use drugs? You know, a lot of people say to kids, why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? But even kids who would inhale things that have like the skull and crossbones on it, <laughs> what are you doing? And I think the answer to that is it makes you feel good. Kids like to feel good. and. That's why they use and this. I saw this picture and I thought that's he's not getting stoned right now. But if he was, that's probably kind of the look he would have on his face, you know. So there's this feeling that kids have, um, and I think that's something to think about as to you know why. Um, that might be a simple answer, but I think it's a good answer. Um, and then I think with kids, there's another issue, which is a reason why kids might feel bad. 
Um, last week I had a girl in the office, and she said, I know my kids smoke pot. I go, why? She says, because they're depressed. She goes, everybody who I talk to who smokes pot is depressed. When they're not using it, they feel down, they feel low, and then they use it, they feel better. So when you look at teens, you think, well, some kids have depression, some have anxiety of just being a teenager. Some of our kids have trauma. A lot of our kids have experienced trauma in their life. Um, there's social problems, school problems, family problems. Um, and the main feelings I work with with kids are uh, feelings of anger, where they get mad about things, they don't know what to do with it. Um, they feel ashamed, um, they feel embarrassed, they don't know what to do with it. Many kids feel powerless where they, you know, last year I worked with a 12-year-old um, who, in, in my private practice, and he, uh, I introduced him to the concept of powerlessness, and reluctantly so, I was like, I never really talked to a kid that young about being powerless. And it was very interesting to me, he had things going on with his family, his brother was sick, his parents were divorcing, um, and I introduced the concept to him, and he, the next three times I met with him, he came in and the first thing he talked about was being powerless. I didn't ask him, hey, do you feel powerless this, this last couple weeks? But he talked about how everything he does in his life, he has no say over. He's, uh, his, everything going to his parents, he has no say over. Everything they do in school, he has no say over. Everything in his life, he's just got to do it. And he's depressed. And he says, and when that concept for him was interesting to see him give words to that um, and give meaning to that. Um, and then also fear, kids have a tremendous amount of fear, and sadness too. So those feelings are there for young kids, and they don't know what to do with it. So if you do have bad feelings, um, if you do use drugs and feel good, then you can see why somebody would, would uh, repeat that. So you know, you, this, you know, this picture here is people using, everybody's happy, you got your peer group. And I think that's a, that's a powerful force for kids, the feeling of feeling good, and a lot of times they're doing it with their friends and it's done in the context of some kind of social context. So, you know, the, uh, the idea of when somebody experiences pleasure, you have a release of dopamine in the brain. And, um, you know, there's over 100 neurochemicals in the brain that give us the feelings when we wake up, we go to sleep, talking to somebody. Um, if you like chocolate cake, you get in your brain a release of dopamine. If you like to watch TV, you get dopamine. You listen to music. Anything you do that creates that feeling of pleasure is a release of the neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain. So when you look at the brain on the outside, you know, the cerebral cortex on the outside where all our thinking is done, um, you know, the other animals don't have that like we do. But even in a rat's brain, there's a reward pleasure circuits right at the heart in the center of the brain. And that's where the dopamine is found and that's where the dopamine is released. So the reward pleasure circuits are right in the center of the brain and they can be very, very powerful. So the formula is, is that you know, dopamine can sometimes trump logical thought. So I thought, well, you know, anybody who smokes cigarettes, they know that it's not good for them. That's a logical fact. Everybody knows that, but people do it. It's very difficult to quit. Why? You know, why? You know you're putting that second donut in your mouth, and you just know you should not be doing it. You know, like, oh, I got to watch this, got to watch that. And then it's like, oh, the heck with it. You know, why would anybody be a Buffalo Bills fan when you think, right? <laughs> you, know, you're like, well, you know, how many years do you have to go? <laughs> but there's got to be some feeling that you want to go after, right? And, and the thought, well, you know. Sometimes feelings trump thought. We know that for sure. All mood altering chemicals release this chemical in the brain. And that's why kids don't go trick or treating for broccoli. You know, or if you were to give the pencils out to the kids, you're a dummy because they don't want the pencils. They want candy because that feels good. There's nothing in broccoli that releases dopamine in the reward neural pathways in the brain. So uh, every drug, whether it's cigarette smoking or whether heroin or uh, marijuana, alcohol, all the drugs that kids use, um, that you get that release in the brain. That's what makes them feel good. Um, one girl I talked to a couple of years ago, she uh, used heroin, and she said the first time I used it, she goes, I was afraid of it, and it really, it just was not a good experience for me. She says the second time I was more comfortable, and she said, I, and you know, as an 18-year-old kid, she said, I knew when I had it the second time that if I had it a third time, I would never stop. And she used it a third, she never stopped. And that gives some idea, I think. You don't hear that with other drugs. You don't hear that with alcohol. You don't hear with uh, other drugs as much. But with the opiate drugs, you do hear that, where it just takes a few times. And this is when we see kids, you know, how can a kid be addicted when they start off using painkillers for uh, wisdom teeth pulled or, you know, surgery? And it's, a very, it's a real danger that people are given those drugs. They use them. And then that can create that feeling. And the formula here is the more dopamine you get, 
the stronger the urge to repeat. So if you really had a good meal someplace, that's why you want to go back again. If you really had a great conversation with a friend, that's why you want to go back and do it. Oh, let's get together again. That's why we want to do things again. So the brain registers, oh, that was pleasurable, and I really enjoyed surfing. Oh, let's go again. I want to do it again. You know, some golfers, you know, they torture themselves. But there's always that shot from a golfer's frown, right, where it's like, oh, that was so great. And you feel that pleasure. And then you want to try it again. So when we think about that for kids, the more pleasure they get from something, they're very susceptible to repeats, to re redoing again. So drugs can hijack the system and then dominate the brain functioning in the brain. And that's where we see addiction, where uh, the drug takes over. That neural pathway in the feeling part of the brain trumps logic. And we all have some sense of that. You know, uh, For the past uh, 15 years, I've been teaching classes on drugs and addiction, drugs and society. And I always ask my students, write a paper about something that you have a loss of control over, something that you know isn't good for you, but you're doing it anyway. I have never had a student in the last 15 years tell me, I can't do this paper. You know, Everybody's got that experience with it. So it's not that there's the drug addicts over here and the non-drug addicts over here. The human brain is the same. Drugs, they'll hijack the system. And this is the danger for young people. The system can get hijacked, and then they lose control. It's not in charge of them anymore. So that would be addiction. Um, with the recent findings that I uh, have here tonight, we have some national statistics. Um, we have Monroe County um, Youth Risk Survey, which is done every two years. We do that here in the school, um, and many of the schools around the county do that. Um, and then um, we did a student survey with groups of students in health class and study hall. We did like a, um, a town hall type meetings with the kids to see what they say. Um, this was a, uh, a little chart that said, you know, the top drugs being used among eighth graders nationally and 12th graders on the right. Um, marijuana was the tops for both of those, and I think that's very true. Marijuana is a real issue. Um, for the younger kids, it was inhalants, and a lot of times um, they get that for free or they find that around the house. And then synthetic marijuana, cough medicine was number four. And I think that's interesting because kids can buy that. They can get it from home. They can use that. It's called robo-tripping. You just drink some um, cough medicine, and you kind of get like a hallucinogen type high if you can drink enough of it. So um, I'm not recommending that you try it, but it does happen, and kids do use that. Um, and then for the older kids, Adderall, and you see synthetic marijuana, then Vicodin, tranquilizers, cough medicine at 4%. So um, this particular chart left out alcohol. And you always see these numbers, alcohol use in the past 30 days. Those are the studies that are done across the country in the um, Monroe County surveys. Did you use alcohol in the last 30 days? And that gives a rough number of, you know, are you maybe using it on a regular basis? And alcohol, as far as I'm concerned, is a real major problem around the county, across the country. Here we see um, you know, 21% of 10th graders saying they've used in the last 30 days, 35% of 12th graders. Nationally, in Monroe County, you see around the same thing, around 30%. Our seniors were, uh, the senior high was 24%, um, NGA was around 13%, and Rothenberger at 5%. So you see that alcohol use going up throughout high school. Um, so those were our numbers. Um, and then the, the trend here is good. This was um, from the uh, Monroe County Youth at Risk Survey. When you look at 2005 to 2015, you see in that 10 year slice, you see the numbers go down. In particular, that red dot, um, that red line is the last use in the last 30 days. That's kind of like the thing used. And you see that numbers are going down. And I think that's very good. I think that's a part of our prevention efforts. Um, and I think you can see that happen. Now, you see that continue to go that way. Um, now, what do the Russian and the other students say about alcohol? I got um, a, a survey. I met with the kids in their health classes, and I gave them a very simple survey. Um, alcohol, I would say. And you could say, I don't, I don't know anything about that. So they could check that. And then they could say, well, it's not happening here in school. And I wasn't asking individuals, do you use? I was just asking kids, do you think it's a problem here? So do you think it's happening? Um, that would be the third answer. It's happening, but it's not a problem, which is an interesting question for kids to respond to. Oh, and, you know, kids are smoking pot, but it's not a problem. And then the fourth one was, it's a problem. And then the last one is, it's a very serious problem. The one thing I saw from these surveys, I did a very quick survey. It does not take them very long to do. There was only one sheet that I had that had all the answers the same, like they just kind of went ch -ch -ch -ch, you know, threw it out. So I took that one, I threw it out. But every one of them, you could see the kids were thinking, and there was variety on their answer sheets. So um, I asked our kids drinking during the school day, and you know, 70%, uh, and the blue line is uh, the ninth grade and 10th graders, and then you've got the 11th and 12th graders, and those are two different sets of brains. 
um, when you look at a senior in high school compared to an eighth grader or a ninth grader, you know. Um, and the answers were very different. But this one was, you know, most of the kids, 70% of the kids are saying it's, it's just not happening. Um, and I think kids are smart. I think they know if they come to school and they're using drugs, I think they know that they can get in trouble for that. Um, so I think in their minds they say, oh, I'll just push up. If a kid is using in school, that's a sign to us. Why do you have to use in school? Do you, you, know, do you have a, an addiction problem that you have to use? Um, we see some kids vaping in the bathroom sometimes. They're addicted to nicotine. They've got to get that nicotine fixed. They can't go the day without it. Um, but with the alcohol, you know, we see our kids are saying, no, that's not a problem. Um, with kids drinking and driving, um, you know, see the red line there with the, uh, the seniors there saying it's problematic. You know, that's, and they're the ones who are doing the driving. Um, and then you see the, uh, the older, um, that one line saying not happening. Um, but the older kids say, well, yeah, I think they see more of it. And it's what this does, I think this gives us a way to talk with the kids and have a dialogue with them and get this out in the open and say, okay, what more do you think about this? And then how can we help this? How can we prevent this from happening once we talk to them? So that's the idea. This one, you know, this concerns me. You got the ninth graders, uh, what is it, about 60% saying, yep, alcohol on weekends is a problem. Partying on the weekends is a problem. And then you see the seniors saying it's a serious problem. And you got about, oh, 25% of the se seniors saying this is a serious problem. The other 40% of the seniors are saying it's problematic. So I think that's honest on their part to say um, there's drinking going on. I think there needs to be education with parents as well about you know, what kind of drinking is going on at your house and are you aware of that? Um, is there somebody there? You know, and you're responsible for everything that happens in your house when those kids are there, whether you're there or not. So this, uh, these numbers you know, concern me. I think the kids are pretty honest about answering those questions. With cigarettes, um, in the past 30 day use, we've seen these numbers come down over the last uh, few years. Nationally, it's about you know two percent for the eighth graders. For us, it's Rothenbergers at one percent, four percent, NGA four percent, senior high nine percent, Monroe County nine percent, nationally nine percent, and those numbers have gone down. We asked the kids about cigarette use. Do you think it's a, a problem? And about 40, 50 percent of our you know ninth graders and eleventh, uh, twelfth graders say yeah, it's a problem, or they say well, it's happening, but it's not a problem. And I think that tells a little bit of a story as well. So they know kids are smoking. They know kids are doing that. Um, the trend in Monroe County has come down from you know, 45% in 2005 down to, you know, what do we have now, 25%. So it's come down almost uh, 50%. And that, uh, and that was ever tried smoking at the top. That middle line is the red one again where it's in the last 30 days. And even that's come down a little bit as well. Um, one of the problems we have now is e-cigarette use um, nationally. Uh, you know, we see 13% for the 12th graders. Monroe County was 20% of kids uh, using e-cigarettes in the last 30 days. Senior high here was about 12%. Fairport High is 34%. And they have a huge problem there. It's even higher um, when they do some of the talking with the kids now. I would hate to see that move seven miles this way and become a part of our culture. It's a part of the culture of that high school and that area. Um, you know, my son plays ice hockey. He went over there this summer uh, to the rink in Fairport. And when he came out, he goes, I couldn't see anybody in the locker room. I go, what do you mean? He goes, we had 15 boys in the locker room. 12 of them were vaping in the locker room. You know, all the, the big client, that doesn't go away in a rink. You know, he goes, I got to get out of here. He goes, this is like creeping me out. And, you know, that's like all the Fairport kids on the east side rink. You know, um, we could have this problem. They definitely have this problem. And um, you know, some kids are making their own vape juice. They can order from the internet. They can order uh, nicotine by the bottle and make their own. Um, I talked to one kid from Webster. He was making his own vials for five dollars. He makes them for fifty cents or whatever. And he's got his own little berry flavor, bubblegum berry, that he talks to the kids about, and he's basically selling that product. And uh, he's making pretty good money doing that. So, you know, the East Side with uh, Fairport, Webster, I think they have more of a problem with this, and I would love to see this stay where it's at. Um, we had caught a couple kids today, I guess, in the bathroom vaping. So we'll, we'll deal with that. You know, that's going to happen. Um, and then you see from 2010 to 2014, the number of um, the percentage goes up to 16% from about 2%. You know, this is just a recent phenomenon with kids. Um, you know, with adults, I've talked to many adults who quit smoking using e-cigarettes, so that's great. But when we have young people using this, and then they're using more and more nicotine, um, some of them using all day. One kid uh, I work with, he um, was using, we figured out he's smoking the equivalent of four packs of cigarettes a day by vaping all day using uh, 24 milligrams of nicotine in his, in his vape pen. You know, it's like a constant, constant, constant. How he'll ever be able to stop, I'll never know. He's, he's 20 years old and 
He's been using that much for two years. It's a real, nicotine's a real addictive problem, a real addiction. So these numbers have gone up, um, and we've all seen that around here for sure. Um, so when the kids say as much, they're saying, you know, well, it's happening, but it's not a problem. That's about 40%. And then we've got another 40% of the upperclassmen saying, it's a problem. You know, so I think they're pretty honest about that. Um, pot use in the last 30 days nationally for 12th graders is 21%. Monroe County is 22%. Our senior high uh, tested out 17%. NJ was 11%. And Rothenberger were very low. So again, you see that um, you know, middle school, 9th grade, 12th grade, the numbers go up. You know. Um, Although the Monroe County trend, when you see from 2005 to 2015, has kind of pretty much stayed the same um, and come down slightly. Um, but my uh, talking with the kids and hearing what's going on, I, I, I think that number, it's, it's larger than maybe what they've gotten in that study. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then here's our, you know, our kids are telling us as much. They're saying, uh, and this one concerns me where it says, you know, We've got 40% of the seniors saying, well, it's happening, but it's not a problem, OK? And then we've got the kids, uh, you know, over 50% of the NGA and 10th graders saying it's a problem. And then we got the seniors admitting almost 30% of the seniors are saying this is a serious problem. Um, and I think is what happens is kids will leave school or kids will go away on weekend. The pot comes out. People use it. Um, I think they know not to smoke. It's very smelly. If a kid's been using, you can really smell it on them. So they know, you know, they can't bring it into school or you're going to get caught. Um, but I think once they leave school grounds, I think the, you know, the kids are using pot, and I think there could be some, you know, some prevention measures based on these numbers. So I'm so glad that the kids you know, took this and answered honestly and are talking about this. In my mind, this gives us some areas that we can work on. Um, pot use on weekends was also very, very, uh, I don't want to say high, <laughs> but 45% um, of the younger kids were saying it's a problem. And then you got those uh, seniors again saying this is a serious problem. So you can probably say the upperclassmen are probably using a lot. Um, and we didn't ask about whether you're uh, under the influence while you're driving as a senior. You know, I think that's a concern as well. And then we've got Massachusetts just went legal. Maine just went legal. California just went legal. Um, it's probably a matter of time before at some point you know, New York State uh, also follows. There seems to be so much money to be made from the taxing of it. And um, it's probably just a matter of time before that happens. So. Um, I think that's something we can look at. Um, and this last, this last piece I had here was the emotional issues. And we're going back to that thing of kids feeling bad. The uh, Youth at Risk Survey asks, have you ever considered suicide? And these numbers, when I saw these last year, really scared me. They, you know, 15% of the senior high kids say, I've considered suicide. Roth and Berger, 22% said they've considered it. Um, and Monroe County was at 14%. So it's, you know, it's not out of the norm there. Um, for kids to say they've planned a suicide, we had 24% of the kids at the NGA um, say, yeah, they've planned it. I mean, kids will say, yeah, I know how I would do it. doesn't mean they would. But even for a kid to have a plan, that number just struck me as very high. The attempts are at 7%, and that's pretty much the same across the board. Um, and then we have kids who are cutting or doing self-harm, 20%, 25%, 25%. I mean, you know, kids are really hurting. And then they had a couple questions there that said, do you feel sad or hopeless for two weeks or longer where you have a hard time studying, you have a hard time doing what you need to do. And you know, 30% of our kids at senior high said, yeah, I've had a couple weeks like that in my life. Um, and I think that goes back to the idea of sometimes kids don't feel good. And they're telling us that they don't feel good. You know? um, so that part of the survey really struck me. And then uh, you know, we got together, the social work department at our, the high school got together, and we came up with our program called Reach Out of the Dark. You know, tough times, just no time to be alone. Ask for some help. We've given these posters to all the teachers in the school. Uh, all the teachers got the button that we wear, the reach out buttons. And, um, um, and just raise awareness of you can talk to anybody. It's, it's in green there. You can't see it too well. It says talk to a teacher, talk to secretaries, talk to somebody. Don't keep that a secret. Um, and just last week, we had a kid who was in the cafeteria who was looking kind of sad. Um, one of our assistant principals came up to him and said, you know, are you doing OK? And she kind of called him aside. She brought him down to my office. And sure enough, this kid really, he really needed some help. He was showing it. You know, we reached out to him. We saw what he was doing. And, um, and he is getting more help than he was getting sitting by the table by himself. I'm really you know, happy that, that kind of attitude the staff has. And just to pick him up and to see, you know, he doesn't look right. He looks like he's sad. And just to go up to him and say, you know, you need some help. And he, he did. He needed it. And he got it. So, um, we're doing this program at the senior high and ninth grade right now. And then um, the kids, I've talked to a bunch of kids who've agreed to do um, some uh, work with 
YouTube and social media for older classmen to kind of talk to the younger kids. So we want to do it at Berger and Roth and then have uh, YouTube, social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, and have kids sharing a little bit of their stories and doing some songs and doing some things to the younger kids. So we would have the, the older kids in the school reaching out to younger brothers and sisters, so to speak, and I think that's a great idea. Kids are all for it. I've got kids who are working on songs, working on poems, working on their testimonies, and we'll just kind of video it, and then we'll put it up, and we'll have that. So I feel really good about this program, kind of addressing those issues with the suicide, you know. Um, some of the other responses here, um, this was one thing that we did last year. We had the civics classes get together and talk about the opiate addiction problem. And I'd like to play this for you. This, are we okay on time? Okay. <laughs> um, and they put together this uh, video. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we work with the Sheriff's Department and the Coalition on uh, Drug Prevention and Safety. And this is on YouTube. those phrases, you know. Safety Coalition and then the Sheriff's Department we talked with them and they supported the project and you know, happy to work with the kids and then we uh, went into the civics classes um, with Marissa Steve and Ted and they each one donated two kids for the project um, and Alan uh, our blues musician did the great music so these are the kids involved one two three four five six seven eight and Alan did all this music by himself, he does the guitar, he does the bass, he does everything, which is fantastic. And it was a great collaboration with the kids and with him, and um, I think it was very rewarding for them. So we made up posters, and we uh, put the posters up at the area pharmacies, so people can see where to go in the pharmacies, we're grateful for that. And then um, we're doing more pr promotion around where you can get rid of the drugs, because you're just flushing them down the toilet is just, you know, not a very good option, right? Um, so here's our the Health and Safety Coalition. Um, when I come on last year, we didn't have any kids on board. Now we've got three kids who are um, donating their time every month. They come in, and um, we're right now the kids are looking at these numbers with the the survey from the kids. So alcohol use and pot use are really um, want there to be the focus. Um, you know, and my thought is when kids are showing signs of the drug use, they're telling us they need some help with something. Um, so. You know, my attitude with the kids here has not been to catch kids using drugs. It's as much to engage with kids and connect with kids. Um, so if somebody does get um, on the radar with showing some signs, we have the care team. The care teams meet every two weeks at NGA and at the high school. 
We'll discuss kids. Uh, teachers might see somebody who's showing signs. We'll talk about um, coming up with an action plan for them. Um, if somebody is suspected of using right in the school, we have a rule out chemicals report. So they would see the nurse. Sherry, you've done a number of these, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they would meet with the administrator right there. And then if somebody's using, we're going to get them help that they need. Um, I do chemical assessments with kids to say, you know, does it look like you can benefit from going to a treatment center or um, you know, just to be seen by a treatment center. I don't really do evaluations for kids. That's more of a clinical thing. But just do an assessment to say, is this kid um, would benefit from going to getting some help for individual counseling or group counseling, um, whatever that might be. So I do a number of assessments, especially if they get in trouble at school where they get, in, uh, you know, they get suspended for two or three weeks, they have to see me in order to move further to get out. Um, I do a presentation with kids in the, the health classes and um, uh, also, I went over to Volmer a few times last year, which was great. And I have a, like a myth conceptions around drugs. Like kids say pot is not addictive, you know, and that's just a bunch of nonsense. I work with so many uh, pot addicted people in my career. Um, I just should mention too, you know, I, I worked 10 years at Park Ridge Chemical Dependency when I started my career, and then I did 15 years of private practice and teaching at MCC before I came here. So um, I work with so many people addicted to pot. And I do a little presentation on, well, let's talk about that. And, um, we have good sessions in the uh, health classes. So we're doing that. Um, and we have the, uh, the DWI reenactment or the, you know, the rescue there in, the, in June, right the same day of the senior ball. Um, and we're trying to connect with parents and give them information and support. I think that connection is the key word. With uh, kids, I'm trying to connect with them and understand what they're doing and respond to them um, and not chase somebody, but make a connection with them. And then with the community, connect with the community and do the things we're doing with these messages with, uh, you know, reach out in the dark and uh, drop them in the box. And, um, and this also as well. And then my also thought with um, clubs in the, in, in Ru Russian Head is a fantastic place. It, it's so diverse. The diversity is incredible. The talent with these kids is unbelievable. And we've got 42 clubs at Rach in, uh, in, in the high school and in the junior high. And uh, this is one, I started one this year called Open Mic. And we've only had like four meetings. And these kids are coming out. We put the mic up in front of the room, let them sing, let them read poetry, play the saxophone, whatever you want to do. And if you just want to sit there and listen, well, that's good too. And it's, it's really, uh, we started with five kids. And I think in this picture, we're almost about 30 kids came to the last one. And then they're all talking about it. With Lay Miz, we've lost a few this last week. And I probably this Thursday will be a, a record-breaking number. But you know, kids want to have fun. You know, it's what a great way to have fun. Um, when you look at what Link Crew does, look at all the kids in that group. Um, you know, my thought is all the sports teams, what a great way to get a natural dopamine high from sports. You know, every one of these kids is, is playing. They're getting that it's sensation in the brain. They feel good when they run. They feel good when they work out. That is so healthy for kids. And we have tons of kids involved in this. After the track team is a force in and of itself. You know, when if you go after school, you see tons of kids. With the music, you know, if you do music, you know that feels good. You have 350 kids involved in that. Um, so I think we are providing kids with that feeling. You know, drugs can make you feel good, but only for a short time. I think that's the, the thing we left out in the beginning. Um, I think the, the idea of saying there are healthy ways to feel good that last. And I think we do provide that with kids. And the kids who are showing us signs, I think we're, we're addressing things with them as well. So um, those are my thoughts with how we're doing in the school. And I think we're doing very, very well with what we're providing the kids. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for asking us to come, really. Thank you so I'll much. I'll clean out your medicine cabinets. <laughs> <laughs>